Okay, so uh, I want to continue on talking about uh, women's rights. And so um, one of the um, things that the international community has done is pass this convention on the elimination of all forms of discrimination against women. This is known as CEDAW. And so on the UN website, you can go to the CEDAW page to see uh, all the particulars about the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. And then you can see who are the parties to that particular convention, that is what states, what, what countries have signed on. And then you can look at what are called reservations to CEDAW. And this is where countries will sign on, but they put in a reservation for them to be excluded for uh, certain types of things depending upon particular practices. Um, so country by country, they can sign on to the, to the CEDAW um, convention um, with the idea that they reserve the right to um, abrogate or um, step away from the convention under certain circumstances. All right. If we think about women's rights, there's this uh, idea that globally, um, and, it's pro and it's, it's true, that across the globe, there's a difference between the experience of women in the West and then everyone else. So women in the West generally live in democracies where there is political and civil rights protected, where there is uh, protection against security rights violations, where in terms of subsistence, women are uh, um, not suffering by and large. This is not to mean that there aren't people in the West that are victims of slavery, that we saw that in the previous lecture, that there aren't women in the West who um, live in poverty. Uh, but in general, the West experience for women is very different than others across the globe. And here we go back to the role of cultural relativism. So does Asian values play a role in the way women are treated? Does Islamic values matter? And so what are the rights of women within Islamic communities? Because this is a big topic now when we think about whether or not women in the Middle East, for example, are denied rights that the women in the West experience, and are they denied rights within their own communities relative to what men experience. So women are treated differently in the Middle East and other types of countries within Islamic State religion. We hear about uh, honor killings, for example, uh, women being um, stoned to death, um, and other types of human rights violations based on gender. And then in, in terms of Africa and African values, and one of the examples that I'm going to focus on is FGM, otherwise known as female genital mutilation. And so that's the area I want to focus on. And so here's a map of African religions, and so we can see where there is a domination of, uh, and so the, the, the larger the letter, the more dominant it is in that particular uh, country. So we can see this is the Islamic Ark, um, but there is in many of these countries a spattering of um, other religions, and so you can see there is some Judaism. This is uh, primarily Hanseatic Jews. Um, and then you have indigenous religions um, and, and Christianity as well. And so, again, one of the cultural practices, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, is female genital mutilation. And Amnesty International estimates that over 135 million girls and women have undergone the procedure, with an additional 2 million uh, each year at risk. And so uh, if we think about what is involved with genital mutilation, the UN and the, I'm sorry, the United States and the World Health Organization categorizes four different types of FGM. But in general, um, the World Health Organization classifies female genital, uh, genital mutilation as all procedures which involve partial or total removal of the external female genitalia or other injury to the female genital organs, whether for cultural or for any other non-therapeutic reason. And so they outline four different types, type 1 and type 2, account for approximately 80% of these procedures, and 15% of the procedures are considered type 3, making type 4 the rarest of them all. However, this most severe procedure still counts uh, for about 15% of the cases that occur in Africa. So according to Amnesty International, 85% of FGM in Africa consists 
of the least radical procedure, um, which is type 1. While the most common age for the procedure is from 4 to 12, there are reported cases of FGM being performed during infancy, all through childhood, just prior to marriage, and even during pregnancy. In Nigeria, in some very traditional communities, if a deceased woman is discovered to never have had the procedure, it may be performed uh, on her before her burial. All right, there's a stark difference between who performs this procedure depending upon the location. Um, and so if it is it's usually carried out by elderly women of the village or tribe in rural areas, but by a midwife or even a doctor in urban areas. So according to Amnesty International, FGM may be carried out in the girl's home or the home of a relative or neighbor in a health center or especially if associated with initiation at a specially designed site such as a particular tree or river. However, anesthetics and antiseptics are rarely, if ever, used, resulting in poor sanitation and hygiene. The instruments used to perform the procedure range from special knives, scissors, scalpels, to pieces of glass or even razor blades. As a result of these poor septic conditions, there are often severe health consequences of FGM. So if we think about some of these, uh, those uh, undergoing the procedure have experienced obviously hemorrhaging and bleeding, and this is going to lead to difficulties later on in life, particularly in menstruation. Some go into shock, and this process includes stitches often made from thorns and the legs may be bound together for up to 40 days. Other side effects might include in the long term incontinence, urine retention, leading to UTIs, kidney damage, chronic pelvic infections. Women who have the procedure are also more likely to experience problems in pregnancy and childbirth. FGM is also likely to increase the risk of HIV AIDS, especially in light of the crude and repeated use of the instruments utilized during this procedure. And lastly, the long-term effects include psychological consequences. And so again, I want to show a, a, another map so if we think about um, while FGM has reportedly occurred in many countries around the world, including some of the countries in the Middle East, it remains prevalent on the African continent. It's been reported in more than 28 countries in Africa, where 18 countries have a rate of 50% or more. And so this is a graphic representation of the areas in Africa where FGM is prevalent. And so just as there is regional and state differences regarding the prevalence of FGM, there's also a variation in the type of FGM practice. And so we see in the chart there, um, Somalia and uh, Djibouti have the highest prevalence rate of 98%, indicating that practically all females in those two countries undergo the type 3 procedure. Approximately 90% of females in both Sierra Leone and the Sudan undergo some form of FGM, usually type 2 in the former, in both type 2 and 3 in the latter. In Mali, 94% of the female population receives some form of FGM. Okay, so we can see this is a, a predominant practice in many of these countries. But by most accounts, FGM is a cultural or ethnic practice and not a religious one. And I think that's an important element to, to remember. It generally occurs in traditional cultures and is considered a rite of passage. As one a woman indicated in regards to her children, she said, of course I shall have them circumcised exactly as their parents, grandparents, and sisters were circumcised. This is our custom. So FGM is viewed as a prerequisite for, a, for adulthood, for becoming a wife, for, for marriage. And studies indicate that parents insist upon the procedure, not out of some form of punishment. Rather, they contend that they truly love their daughters and really want to protect their future. Their daughters will be deemed undesirable by potential suitors should they choose not to undergo the procedure. So for them, undergoing FGM bears a great deal of social significance. And in many of these societies, it brings recognition that a girl has reached womanhood and eventually provides economic security as they enter into marriage, as many of these societies still have a dowry system. And so uh, without this circumcision, without this female uh, genital, what we would call mutilation, 
um, many of these daughters would not be desirable and therefore not be provided for uh, through marriage. And so beyond the social significance, women and girls themselves I indicate that it's an important part of gender identity. And so they believe it has an aesthetic, purifying, and hygien uh, hygienic benefits. In fact, there are testimonies that indicate that many females believe that the um, clitoris, uh, clitoris is both unhealthy and an unattractive organ. There's also an indication that FGM serves a, uh, several sexual functions. First, it's said to enhance ma uh, male sexuality, while at the same time curbing female sexuality. And the latter presumably pre preserves virginity and prevents female promiscuity. As one prominent uh, proponent of FGM in Kenya suggested, circumcision makes women clean, promotes virginity and chastity, and guards young girls from sexual frustration by deadening their sexual appetite. So the rationale for FGM points out its ex essentially sexist nature as girls are kept pure by a painful and debilitating procedure while bo by boy boys are not. So this has led many human rights researchers to conclude that FGM goes beyond a cultural norm and is in fact a violation of human rights. Um, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services says that FGM is a form of violence against women and girls. Cutting must be placed within the broader context of discrimination across women, against women across cultures and as a sy symptom of the greater problem of women's subordination and compromised dignity. The documented complications of female genital uh, cutting constitute a violation of a person's right to physical and mental health, and such fundamental freedoms are protected by several human rights instruments, including the UDHR. So again, this is from the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, indicating that this is a form of violence against women and girls. But there's also documented uh, uh, evidence or documented opinions about why some states still support FGM in Egypt, Mali, Central African Republic, or the CAR, and Eritrea. And so here we have uh, most, uh, and, and the highest bar is based on the idea of this as a practice, a, a tradition, a cultural element, as opposed to a religious requirement, which is higher in Egypt than the other three. There is this idea of a hygienic, uh, a hygiene element, um, cleanliness, uh, and then we get into the other areas that um, deal with preser uh, preservation of virginity, you're going to get better marriage prospects. This is true in Egypt, and you can see in the CAR. Um, then we get into uh, th some of the sexuality arguments um, and the prevention of promiscuity, and we see this most prevalent, comparatively speaking, in Egypt, but still not, a, a, one, of the, not one of the leading reasons why um, in Egypt that that practice is continued. Well, what's being done? Uh, NGOs are leading the way in combating the practice of FGM. In addition, major intergovernmental organizations like the UN Development uh, uh, Group, the World Health Organization, and many European organizations actively fund local NGOs in, Af in Africa in order to try to address this particular practice. Over the last decade, it's become one of the most pressing topics amongst women's groups, and this is particularly true for activist groups in Africa. Many see FGM as a product of gender discrimination, and so organizations are focusing on the education of women and girls. And so we see that in these latter two in particular, the Inter-African Committee on Traditional Practices with the collaboration of local NGOs have launched an extensive educational campaign aimed at eliminating FGM. And women in Egypt and Sudan recommended education as the best means to end this practice. The WHO published an agenda for its elimination in 1996, calling on governments to formulate a clear national policy against the practice, including enacting legislation, to provide funding for research into the prevalence, causes, and health consequences of the practice, 
to establish community outreach programs focusing on education, attempting to use all forms of media for public service announcements, trying to prohibit the practice by licensed health professionals, and provide rehabilitation, treatment, and counseling for those who have undergone the procedure, and try to target those in traditional societies who, pra who participate in the practice through education and training. And the ultimate goal is to eliminate the procedure. And of course, the goal is to eliminate men at all stages in order to try to change their attitudes. So international groups have reported that FGM is slowly declining in some areas due to some of this increased efforts at education and awareness. In areas where FGM is continued, individuals are increasingly opting for the least severe form. But FGM occurs and is spread beyond the African continent, primarily due to the increases in refugees and immigration in the West. And so this is the article um, that focuses on Mimi Ramsey um, and her experience when she, uh, when she came to the United States. So in the, oops, in the United States, there's been an increase uh, in the number of women and girls undergoing the procedures, again, not only in the United States, but in Europe. So in 1997, the U.S. government passed federal laws outlawing this practice for girls under the age of 18. But since 1998, 16 states have made FGM a criminal offense. In addition, informational and educational instruction is being offered to immigrants as well as information on the illegality of the practice in countries such as Australia, Canada, France, the Netherlands, Sweden, the UK, and the United States. And lastly, the U.S. State Department as well as NGOs like Amnesty International provides information regarding individual African countries' legal approach to eliminating FGM. So many African countries have passed laws and issued presidential decrees prohibiting the practice. There are no formal laws, however, banning the practice in Nigeria, Somalia, or Uganda. Um, and so this is where I think the international community will focus in the future. All right, so um, that's where we'll end this particular lecture. Um, the next two lectures are going to focus on children. I think it'll be two lectures, maybe one. Um, so we're going to switch our gears to talking about children, both male and female children.